conversation. I'm going to hand things off to him, Thanks. and then we'll go from there. Hi, this is a, a really an honor to have a chance to speak to you. I feel like I'm making a little bit of a circle in my career because uh, for a year, I took a year off of medical school uh, to try to figure out really what I wanted to do. And I became a medical student fellow in the Department of Pathology at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And I spent the whole year, you know, uh, doing autopsies, preparing slides, attending uh, reading conferences, and uh, really enjoyed it. I think that it played a big role in the approach I took to internal medicine. And then when we started doing a project that had the word autopsy in the name, or at least in the concept, uh, I remembered all that, like it, some of it, some of that old pathology work snuck into how I thought we should do this work. So I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I'll be describing a study that's funded by the VA, but jointly conducted at the VA and UAB focused on understanding the clinical context of suicide following opioid transitions. This is a work in project. I'm the principal investigator. Views are uh, not those of any federal agency, including the VA. I'm not involved in opioid litigation, et cetera. I own some stock in different uh, health company and edit a chapter and up to date. I get royalties, have been involved in one opioid dis dispute uh, between an insurer and a doctor, and this is under two IRBs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our aims team study design and what makes a study unique uh, and really focus on the challenges of recruitment, which are really uh, unique. So let me just mention the aims first and then I'll get to how we got to these aims. But the, st the study purpose is to characterize patient and context factors associated with suicide among 110 to 115 people who have died by suicide in the context of a prescription opioid reduction, and to identify factors that differ between those suicides carried out by veterans or people who have a history of service in the United States Armed Forces and non-veterans. Uh, the method is psychological autopsy. The team we assembled to do this work is crucially diverse because of the nature of the work and the challenges of the recruitment, which are going to be a big part of this uh, presentation. So we have research and clinical experts shown on the left. I'm the PI. We have a medical anthropologist, Megan McCullough there, an opioid drug abuse uh, internal medicine doctor there, the third down, a health systems implementation scientist, Allison Varley, our study coordinator, with several people who have been either lived the experience of being a patient with pain on prescribed opioids or who've lost someone to suicide after a prescription opioid reduction in the second column. We've linked up our study with people who are patients themselves, but have a strong role in federal policy and federal meetings, including the NIH HEAL initiatives in that third column, and then found suicide experts like, crucially, Thomas Joyner, probably one of the most cited suicide research authorities in the world, uh, and founder of one of the key theories of suicide there on the right. So there has been a signal of concern that led to the desire to do this study, and it is statistical in nature. So as the insurer, many of you understand, there's been a massive reduction in prescribing of opioids in the United States since 2012. If you look at morphine milligram equivalents per capita, we went all the way back to the level of 1999. If you look at prescriptions per capita, we we're at the level of 1992. So all the high went all the way back. And there are signals of trouble in how that unfolded, three of which are database analyses that hint. One is a Veterans Administration large database retrospective analysis. Uh, I'm a co-author on this one and actually helped prompt it being done because we saw trouble in the VA. Opioid discontinuation in people who are on opioids was associated with a statistically elevated likelihood of death by suicide and death by overdose. This was a study that was a large retrospective database. The VA can control for diagnoses recorded in the record for other co-prescribed medications. It cannot show why or how opioids were stopped. It cannot show whether these data are still current because the analyses they did were looking at changes from 2012 to 2015. Another signal of concern, this one is from Oregon Medicaid. That's a big deal because Medicaid programs sometimes pioneered in the area of getting people off of opioids and others came under pressure from the federal government to show that they could do that. 
So in Oregon, Medicaid retrospectively a suicide event, some of which are fatal, some of which involve a hospital admission for suicidality, was more common among people who had a reduction or stoppage. Now, the 1% versus 0.3% comparison, I believe, is actually for um, an analysis looking at stoppage versus not. And then there's a separate analysis with slightly different people looking at reduction before stoppage, which you would think would prevent trouble, but actually the percentage is higher, 1.4%. Small n, why were these stopped? Was it at the request of the patient? Were they feeling better? Was it because the doctor was concerned that the patient had just used cocaine and overtaken their pills? None of those things are knowable from these kinds of analyses. They're just a signal. And then a third one, uh, using national Medicare slash private health insurance data, there's a series of three papers from the same group from UC Davis where they find mental health crises are elevated with a 15% dose change. And uh, those crises are not just elevated acutely in the way that you might think are related to uh, acute withdrawal, but out to 24 months. Sorry, I need to turn this off, suggesting that there's something more complicated going on and that you can't just attribute this to acute opioid withdrawal. But why or how these took place, no one knows. So in the face of statistical data, some federal agencies spoke up and they tried to reach conclusions they felt they could stand on to protect patients. Among them, the Food and Drug Administration issued a warning after seeing the VA data and said, we should avoid rapid or abrupt taper. There's a risk of suicide. But if you notice what I presented, the outcomes were not restricted to rapid or abrupt taper. CDC also issued a clarification in 2019. I played an advocacy role in helping them come to the conclusion they should issue that clarification. But their 2022 guideline is even more blunt on discouraging uh, non-patient-centered dose reductions across the board. They say we kind of overshot the mark in terms of how people acted on our last guideline. Please don't do this again. And the Veterans Administration has an interesting thing because it's been under tremendous pressure to reduce opioids. But at the same time, if you open up our software product, the Opioid Risk Mitigation Software Panel, there's a warning at the top that says, warning, discontinuing of opioids doesn't necessarily make your patient safer. In fact, it's been shown to be associated with increased risk of suicide and overdose death. So when you check a risk of a patient, you're actually being warned to be cautious. But these declarations actually say very little about suicide. Um, yes, uh, I'm sure that slower reductions in dose avert the condition known as acute withdrawal. Uh, in reports to date, slower reductions don't substantially alter overdose or suicide risk, however. Suicide is really not the ordinary result, even of an involuntary reduction in opioids in a patient who's been on them. This is not a very typical event. So we really need to think about suicide in a more serious way if we want to understand what's going on and then prevent a tragedy. We can't just use these statistical analyses. That is the four central point of our study. And there's really a key question that should be asked, which I think is a pathologist question when you do an autopsy. What happened? Why? And that is not evident in those statistical results, but it was evident in those autopsy reports I had to write as a medical student trying to figure out why an 87-year-old person died at Beth Israel Hospital. It was never just a past slide that we read. It was a story we put together. So one of the reasons we thought we might have a window into this question is that there was a patient who was assiduously collecting reports on public and social media of death by suicide, a patient herself on high-dose opioids named Anne Fuqua. And in this photo that's staged a little bit like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, except that Anne is on the side rather than in the center, she's explaining to our research team this is something you need to look at. And her work is still going on today. She charts what she finds. She creates attestations as to how many suicides she's heard of. And indeed is described in the New York Times at the beginning of last year by Maya Salowitz, a regular columnist. We can't just take Anne's data. It's fragmentary. Uh, it's not consensual. Uh, it's not a medical record. <laughs> Um, it's not even a person we can speak to, but we think that that's the inspiration for why we felt we could do this. But if you think, just to, I want to highlight for a moment why 
statistical analyses are insufficient to understand these tragedies. So imagine if you took common, this, I mean, yet everybody publishes these large database statistical analyses in JAMA, JAMA Network Open, Annals of Internal Medicine, even New England Journal sometimes. But if you did this with plane crashes, this is how it would work. You'd say, I want to know why planes crash. And you create a database of all the planes that went up in the sky. And you would uh, find that if you went down. So you'd have a, you know, one if it went down, zero if the plane stayed up. Now we're getting ready for logistic regression. And you'd have some standard data elements that are always available for all airplane flights because FDA records them. And might be pilot age, the aircraft age, the weather, last maintenance date. And then you just throw it all into the statistics machine and find out what popped out. And you'd say those things cause plane crashes. But that's not really how we respond to airplane crashes. We do not trust. I mean, there's no way we would trust that statistical analysis to tell us why the bolts fell out of an airplane, uh, the rivets, or a, a plug for a door. Um, so a different model to understand a complex tragedy here, now back to suicide, is to say there are many influences operating at once. We need to make sense of them all. We need to study them systematically. This is a socio-ecological model for suicide which has elements at the level of society, community, organization, interpersonal, including whether a person is socially isolated or has unstable relationships or in a veteran combat exposure, burdensomeness, and individual factors like their psychological state. Uh, how would we take this to an airplane crash? I use the example of TWA Flight 800, which crashed in 1996. Uh, this crashed 12 minutes after takeoff from JFK. It fell into the Long Island Sound or Atlantic Ocean. 230 people died. There were some people who thought they saw a fiery thing go at the airplane. There were rumors that it was a missile that was fired perhaps from Long Island. And no one ran a statistical model. Instead, they dragged all the parts out of the Atlantic Ocean and they reassembled an airplane as best they could. And these various federal agencies got together and they came to a conclusion that the explosion in this case was due to an ignition of a flammable fuel air mixture in a hot and mostly empty center wing tank that was mostly empty at the time of takeoff on a summer day. And there was a modest spark which set off the explosion. And rules were changed to prevent these kinds of airplanes from going down. This is the value of case investigation because the rules are changed. We haven't had that kind of crash since. And you cannot imagine a world in which somebody publishes a paper in JAMA Network Open running a large statistical database analysis that would ever get to the prevention of this crash. This kind of work has been done in the case of suicide. Uh, equivocal suicides were the original interest. I have here what I think is the second paper, 1963, from Los Angeles, although the first I haven't gotten was published in 57. And in Los Angeles County, they were first just trying to figure out, are these deaths suicides or are they not suicides? And uh, they developed methods to investigate by talking to the survivors and by looking at the bodies, et cetera, to figure out what did they have. And there's been a body of research, very often of a statistical nature, which ours is not, but looking at all the factors they could collect by speaking with proxies and sometimes medical record collection to assemble a story of each suicide. For an example, our team actually obtained training in doing psychological autopsy from the American Association of Suicidology, and they had us do a case. The case was based on public information, specifically the death of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. So there are actually a host of significant risk factors in the death of Kurt Cobain, that are the kinds of things we look for. So first of all, in his family, there was a suicide attempt or completion in four relatives. Early life, he had tremendous parental separation and conflict that left him probably with less emotional resources than others when he entered his teen years. He had severe chronic abdominal pain, a little bit of an overlap with our study. Many of our patients are pain patients. He did use heroin initially recreationally as he was building his rock career, but not a lot. And then at a later time, he decided to use it regularly. And he said he used it because of pain that made it so bad that he thought he would kill himself if he didn't treat the pain. There was then, interestingly, in the two-year period shortly before his death, he had a few periods where he received what we would now regard 
as evidence-based therapy for opioid use disorder, methadone, and then when it wasn't approved for it, buprenorphine. And then in March, she had an overdose event, but not with opioids, but with alcohol and rohypnol. Uh, there was a social intervention where people gather around you and tell you you really need to go into treatment. Uh, the evidence for this itself is quite poor, but he was sent to Exodus Rehabilitation Center, which did not offer treatment for opioid withdrawal, uh, which he likely was in. So he, in a 24-hour period, he climbed over the back fence and left, and he returned to Seattle. He had had his guns taken away, uh, but he managed to have get somebody to buy another one and somebody else to buy ammo, and he shot himself, and he died relatively shortly after that detox. And I think that one could devise lessons about responding to people with pain and opioid use disorder, in part from a single case like this. But what would you do if you had 100 cases? That's what's more interesting to us. Some of the questions that we wish to approach when we carry out a combination of interview and for some medical records review are things that we thought up in advance, things I put into the grant proposal. So for example, how many decedents had a rapid or a slow taper? Was there any hint of potential for self-harm in that individual before or after a prior suicide attempt, some hint of other trouble? How many stated to others they were concerned about what was happening to them, that they might uh, be in trauma or in trouble because of what was happening with their pain care or because of something else? Were there these classic psychological risk factors for suicide, two which are drawn out by Dr. Thomas Joyner, whose picture you saw, are the perception that one is a burden to others, the other is a sense of a thwarted desire to belong to a group. You no longer can. You're thwarted in your desire to belong. Those are two that are considered important theoretically. What healthcare contacts took place before the suicide? This would be helpful because it might odd identify points of intervention that could lead uh, health systems to be more responsive or insurers even to be more responsive. Did the healthcare itself feature conflicts or impasses between the doctor and the patient about their care? Is that a warning sign that something could go wrong? Was there possession of a medication or a firearm that might have been part of the process of dying? And for veterans, how many went outside the VA? How many went to a local emergency department? The veterans Administration is very interested in suicide, not just by veterans who are VA customers, but by the many veterans who died by suicide who were not engaged in Veterans Administration healthcare. So those are the kinds of questions we could approach. Uh, I'm going to get to recruitment in a moment, but the way we tend to approach them is through a complex interview. The goal is to get a family member or a friend, someone close, to participate in a roughly two-hour interview. And the interview is recorded. It is going to it's transcribed, they're being transcribed, then it's coded. But interview topics are shown on the right on the slide. Uh, there are certain kinds of what I call faux close-ended questions. You know, Do you think the suicide was related to a specific event? Which is a yes, no, but hopefully leads to, well, yes, and here's what I think that event is. So it's not really close-ended. Uh, were there any changes in the care person received uh, for pain in the six months before death. These questions are not designed, they are going to include covering opioids and stoppage, but they're not designed to assume that the entire reason for a death is that. Remember, this is still the less common outcome of opioid reductions. Uh, so the topics that we, you know, most of them are shown on the right, a little graphic, um, pain history, healthcare, social support, communications with others, place, it's just an example. But now we got to get to the tough thing. And really we spent much of the last year and two years of pilot work on the issue of recruitment. And I think um, the issue is recruiting family members and survivors. We can't just grab a list from somebody else that involve a change in your healthcare before you died. This is extremely unique and it is the thing that no one else does. So the ordinary psychological autopsy studies, which are published every year, there's some come out from somewhere in the world, go to medical examiners and coroners. And these are the traditional way to get a list. And then usually in partnership with a state or county medical examiner, or even a Chinese province, 
They contact the families and say, together with the medical examiner, we're trying to understand suicide. Will you be interviewed? Um, this partly lacks uh, the party. I'm sorry. The medical examiners in the corners don't generally have much information about anti-mortem healthcare changes. So this is not a very straightforward method, given the context we're trying to assess. So we can't do it. I guess if somebody gave me the VA list of veterans who died by suicide and said, you can check their medical records, we might be able to do it. But there's some regulatory uh, concerns about sharing information in that way. The second would be if you work for a hospital or a clinic or a healthcare system like Kaiser, where there have been a lot of opioid reductions, to simply go to the families that have lost someone to suicide after your own health system did the reduction and say, hi, uh, we're from Kaiser Permanente. We understand that there was a suicide in your family shortly after we changed the medications on your loved one. Would you like to collaborate with us in a study? This has some problems at a social level. It seems like it would raise a liability risk for the healthcare institution. The family itself may be, feel pretty uh, uh, annoyed and upset and maybe even traumatized to be approached in this way. And I think there's still regulatory problems that occur when you approach people for research based on a complex tragedy uh, that is associated with your healthcare system. It's not impossible, but it would be hard. So we wound up at the following, which is direct to the public media and partnering with organizations to speak to all the audiences that might have suffered this loss and encourage them to come to us as, an, as a separate research team. It's not been tried in any prior psychological autopsy research. It is, requires invention, it requires money, trust, partners. And although we thought we knew what this was, we're still rediscovering what it is we have to do every week right now in this. The general approach here I've tried to show with icons that go across the top and down the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, there's outreach, which can include giving talks. Uh, some of you may hear this talk and say, I heard about this to somebody you know who's lost someone this way. Uh, we have social media, and just recently we launched, actually, we had informal social media promotion, and now we have a campaign paid. Then there's this large screening tool, which is operated within the red cap survey epidemiologic system housed at UAB. And it's pretty big. It's 46 questions. And we have to look at the answers and adjudicate what people said on this online survey. They can also request to do it by phone. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And then based on what they said, we invite them to, if they qualify, to be considered for a full interview, which means an informed consent must be signed at that point. <clears throat> the interview is relatively straightforward. And then there's a separate team at UAB Department of School Public Health that has some skill in getting medical records. And for some of these, we will get records. And then we analyze those cases. To carry this out, certainly have to have expertise in the population and in the problem. You have to have a lot of alliances because the pain community, particularly in the wake of that massive reduction of opioid prescribing, the people who might know most about these losses also have high distrust in official health care because they've had very traumatic changes to their care carried out in the name of, of protecting them. Um, so you have to earn trust and you have to have rock solid confidentiality protections. In our case, not only do we have confidentiality as a general matter, we had to solicit these certificates from NIH that protect the information from subpoena, even if there was a lawsuit. The screening issue, that is a relatively long survey, but if it's done, we adjudicate. Uh, so if somebody were to go to our red cap right now, you could go, you could do a fake one if you want, just say it's a test. You see some consent information, uh, which is, you know, you don't, and then you have to do a, you're asked 46 questions, but one of them is, do you think someone close to you died by suicide after a change in pain medication? This is a screener. It's, do you believe that someone died after a change? So timeline, not a cause. And then later in the survey, there's more detailed questions, which I'm about to show you, that enable us to decide who to invite to the survey. So on the left, remember that not everyone knows what an opioid is. And so they might not be sure what really happened with the medicines, but there's a little explanation of what opioids usually are. And then we say, to the best of your knowledge, did the person who died experience any of the following changes in any opioid pain medication? Check all that apply. It was reduced, it was stopped, it was increased, it was changed in some other way. There was no change, don't know, not sure. And there's free text that can write a lot out. And people do write a lot out. 
And then we generally are going to include the reduced and the stopped, but we read the free text too. We have other people who explain reductions that they didn't check a box for. Suicide is also a potentially un, not truly knowable by anybody sometimes, but if we ask about their confidence. And again, we invite people based on confidence, but we also read the free text. And we've had people say, I'm not sure. And then they describe an event which includes a statement that the person was in distress and they walked out the door and shot themselves in the head. And we're like, okay, they say they're not sure, but the event they write in the free text sounds like suicide will invite them to participate. Uh, we manually adjudicate these. Then we invite. Uh, okay, so what have we gotten so far? There are four lines here. The first line is that there's two yellow lines. <laughs> we got to work on this. But anyway, the top line is the one to whom we sent a consent to be signed. And it includes a fair number of people who had responded when we were in pilot phase and the pilot responses were two years ago. So some of those are stale. And we sent it by email. We didn't get a response. Uh, but some of those people responded. But as time went by, uh, more people began to hear about the study with up-to-date website, up-to-date recruitment materials. And we are getting a high response now, but it looks like we're up to 16 consented as of mid-January. Then uh, scheduling of the interviews and completion of the interviews are in parallel right now. And it looks like this shows us at 11. I believe the 12th one is happening this afternoon. Uh, the, the social... Media uh, turns out to be pretty complicated when you use that. I'll try to explain this a bit. So you do outreach, and if the outreach tries to send people to the 46-item red cap survey, which looks very non-commercial and it's relatively complex, uh, it's awkward. So what we've done in some cases is interpose a screener so now we have social media that goes to, it's really 10 because there's the name and the address and I think date of birth, but it's a shorter screener that is really clean and fast. And then that gets preloaded into the red cap, but a lot of people, they could, if they clicked really assiduously, they could go straight into the detailed red cap. But most people do the seven items on Facebook. I'm about to show you that. And then they leave it. They're done. So we have to reach back out to them to get them to go to the 46 item red cap. That's why there's a picture of a telephone and a picture of an email, because this now requires follow-up. We've just been discovering this complexity in the last month. Uh, we then adjudicate. Now, this is the new landing page that we launched in January a commercial firm which is considered a vendor inside of UAB and therefore is easy to pay, called HLM, prepared a website which is uh, different from our main study website. It is a flat, single-page uh, site. The URL does not have the word suicide or opioids in it. This is because when you advertise with Facebook, they look at those URLs and certain words provoke them to prohibit the advertisement like opioids and suicide. There is the word suicide on the web page, but it's very subtle. The main slogan is, have you lost someone with chronic pain? So no opioids. And then sometimes it even says, study seeks people who've lost someone. Uh, and then you can do a brief screener on that website itself. There's not a bunch of tabs. You're not going to read about the investigators. There's a link to that stuff, but you wouldn't get to it instantly. And our purpose is really simple, improve outcomes for people with long-term pain. And the responses sit in something called WordPress Formidable Database, which we can see working with REDCap people, it can get sort of pipelined into the REDCap, but it doesn't always go through unless the person clicks submit. And, you know, we're just learning this all at once. And then we follow up to, we can see who responded, and then we follow up by phone or email for people whose data didn't go through to see if they want to do more, which they can do by phone. The same thing happens now with the Facebook version of this. You can check out the website from a Facebook ad, but Facebook gives you the power to do advertisements in Facebook with surveys in Facebook. And those responses uh, pop up without you having to leave the app. That's convenient, and it gets a lot of responses. They were pro they're now kind of 10 to 15 a day of these, although a lot of them don't qualify. But we have, it goes through straight to a Google sheet called the lead tracker. And then we follow up with those. But that's a lot of follow-up, and that is the graph that our study coordinator made this week to explain to us the system that she realized we had just accidentally constructed. But 
that is sort of the learning that we're in is that there's eligibilities and ineligibilities, mm -hmm. follow-ups, and data that has to be stored in different places and ultimately as much as possible loaded forward into REDCap. That's the complexity of the marketing campaign for this study, uh, but it's working. Uh, so cumulative here, this is our social media as of about a week and a half ago. 85 people have responded on the Facebook mini survey, 20 directly on our flat landing page, so close to 100 interacting with the pre-screener. They won't all become subjects. But that's you know three or four weeks of publicity. It suggests over a course of a year and a half, we can get 110 actual subjects, much faster than before. The uh, they appear preliminarily to be qualified. That is, if you respond on our, I don't know, one of these is Facebook, the other is, um, yeah, I can't tell what these are. So I think this is pre-screener via Facebook. Yeah, okay. So in the, the cumulative total as of the third or fourth week of January, 85 re reacted, 59 seemed to preliminarily qualify. Then we need, if we could get 10% every month of those to go all the way through, that we'd, we'd get our numbers. Similar kind of thing for our flat web page, which I often publicize independently on my own Twitter account when I give talks. And you know, there you have it. It's it's a lot of work. That's a complicated system we set up. Just to give you a portrait of a miniature portrait of three deaths, and then I'll give you a little more detail of one where we just began as a preparation for coding. We read the transcript. This one is a death uh, of a man. He is in his forties, actually. I want to be clear. We spoke to the spouse, and I'm going to tell you more about this one at, after showing the mini summaries, but he had had reductions in one state, moved to another, and um, he had complex regional pain syndrome, which is a very difficult condition to manage. Uh, a lot of risk factors, as you're going to see. And the spouse does think that the, the new doctor invoking these rules and fear of prescribing led to sudden stoppages of medication and played a big role in his decision to die by suicide. Another one, this is a brother. Uh, he describes chronic pain in the person who died, uh, previous overdose attempts, which left doctors hesitant to prescribe opioids uh, because they were worried they'd contribute to the next one. And the interviewee believed that his brother was caught in the opioid crisis and treated like an addict instead of a pain patient. This polarization of view as to what is pain and what is addiction is a common theme and probably will be part of our study findings. This one is another interesting one. This is a cousin who is the informant, describes uh, his own cousin having chronic pain from a car accident, but is a nice uh, illustrative quote. He was pretty straight up with saying, yeah, I'm addicted, but it was because he needed it. No one else believed him other than his mother. It's not that he didn't have pain, but no one needed to be that wasted all of the time. And again, uh, as uh, medications often procure illicitly became harder to get, uh, he shot himself at a family gathering. I then went through a case transcript yesterday because we're now setting up the coding and interpretation system for the analyses of these. And I were writing 350 uh, word case summaries, a little bit like you'd write at the top of an autopsy report. So I did that yesterday and I took a few lines out of my own summary just to share with you a more detailed story. Uh, this is someone who died at age 46 of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Uh, the informant was the spouse. Uh, this person's parent had died by suicide. So it's a reminder, a little bit of the Kurt Cobain story. Uh, of, uh, there was also childhood sexual abuse. This complex regional pain syndrome was present from 2011 forward and had caused disability, although he was active in his life. Uh, opioids were prescribed. So too was a benzodiazepine. First in one state, then he moved to the other state and he was for a while receiving medicines from the previous doctor in the other state. The family, there had been a lot of conflict in the family. Members of the family in the state that they left saw him as a drug seeker. And this led to conflict with him and conflict with his wife. And his wife wanted them to move out of state partly to escape the family conflict, but also to take care of her aging mother in the other state. In the new state, the doctor stopped the benzodiazepine suddenly and said that they, the doctor felt prescribing the benzodiazepine at the same time as the opioid would lead to the office being shut down by state regulatory authorities because it's um, a combination that the CDC's 2016 guidelines said generally should be avoided or carefully justified. 
but the or carefully justified part is not referenced uh, when the DEA seeks to act. Uh, they don't ask for justification. They just investigate. Um, the uh, doctor also shut, closed or reduced the opioid doses. And at the end, it was a kind of an odd final week where the decedent encouraged his spouse to take over using the better car. Let me use the bad car. You know, I think a taillight is out on is what he said. But that was not the reason. He wanted to die in the bad car so the good car was still usable by his spouse. So he shot himself. He left a note. We know we're getting the note, but we haven't read it. So impact. We don't know for sure, but it's thought that five to eight million people in the United States at any given time are on long-term opioids. Some number have been taken off. Others are still going on. Suicides and overdose after prescription reductions are, to my view, not well understood. Health system interventions could be proposed if we learn more about what happened. We can't merely deduce how to fix healthcare from statistical models based on crude electronic health record derived models. But to do that, to do the work we want to do, we have to earn the trust of people dealing with these losses where they feel traumatized by, in part, the healthcare system. So this is a unique set of clinical circumstances. Public commitments to the protection of people with long-term pain on opioids have been very tentative. Uh, and um, that's why this work is, we're the only ones even trying to do this. Uh, I, I keep thinking someone else will want to beat us to this study. No one wants to beat us to this study. Uh, they just don't want to do this study. So uh, if you would like to share the word, uh, there's lots of ways to put people in contact with us. There are advertisements, of course, now on social media, but there's general study information, which includes a description of all of us and is a very complex website at csiopioids.org. This is hosted at UAB. We just purchased the domain. You can do the full detailed screener, which is uh, the red cap that I've been referring to, the 46 questions. If you go in and you say pathology test, pathology test, want to try it, that's fine. Uh, you can also email me. I'll send you all the questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a one-page information sheet. If you knew somebody and you thought they'd like a PDF, you know, you could actually pull that and share that with them. It's on a Google Drive. And that's the nature of our study. That's what we're doing. Um, I'm happy to speak to other audiences. Um, publicity is a key to getting the study to succeed. Any thoughts, ideas, questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. This. I think this is, you know, very interesting and uh, very necessary. Um, you mentioned that most of the publicity or the, in social media was happening in Facebook, correct? Right now, it seems to me that we are having the most advert. So our advertising campaign is heavily Facebook focused. Uh, I have been suggesting that we go to some newspapers and some communities. Checking. Oh, good. In case people want to ask questions. So I've been asking that we look for, uh, ways to get this into other media. And certainly my colleagues and I have put it on Twitter, nothing on Instagram, uh, a little bit on LinkedIn. Okay. Sure. So, um, and that's very good, but I think one of the, one of the issues with using Facebook would be your audience target, right? So people using Facebook are, or are, you know, older individuals. Uh, and so you're missing, uh, the target audience of, you know, teenagers and people in their 20s, early 30s. Um, so I think that definitely using uh, platforms like Instagram or even TikTok, even though there's, you know, ethical or other problems with TikTok uh, would be incredibly helpful, not only because there's also people with, within that age gap that also have chronic pain and use opioids because of accidents or, you know, different uh, pathologies, but also because that population is more inclined or open to talking about these issues than older individuals. Yeah, not others. I've been frustrated that UAB's IT system prohibits putting TikTok on a cell phone that is connected to UAB's information system. Uh, and yet, I think you're 100% right. I did a podcast recording with some pain advocates on Sunday. And at the end, they said, let's record a TikTok. And the woman held her phone up to her computer to record me talking. So the audio is not great. But she has 350,000 followers and had a 1,000 likes and at least 150 comments within 12 hours of me talking through bad audio on TikTok. So 
Um, I probably need to prepare videos and then give them to them since they have all the followers. Forgive me if I missed this, but after the initial family member or associate fills out the form, is there any attempt to reach out to other individuals who are associated with the decedent to gather more information and maybe be able to put together more of a story? Uh, my answer is ambiguous because I can't remember if we directly asked the question, do you know other people who'd be informative on this case? It has happened that we discover there are other people who would be informative on the case. And we have said, would you like to speak to that person about our study and let them know? But I don't think we've systematically put that question in at the end of the interview, even though it seems perfectly obvious that we could. And in some cases, we are doing three interviews for a single death just because the family said, hey, look at this. We're really concerned about our loved one's loss. Why don't we all sign up? But I think it could be a nice question at the end of the interview, guide. is are there other people you think would like to speak to us? I'm going to make a note of that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, 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 super important topic. Out of the whatever, 40, 50,000 suicide every year, what percentage do you think relate to this problem? It is true that pain is a risk factor for suicide, but I've never seen an estimate of the percentage of suicides that are associated with physical pain. So I believe that um, the percentage of suicides that are likely to be accounted for by prescription opioid reduction will ultimately turn out to be very low. I just, um, even though I think the risk increase is a multiple of three to seven among those people who have opioids stopped, there's just too many other suicides that occur. Uh, so I, I, I can't say for sure, but I do not think that, I think we may get insights that can help us understand many suicides, but I do not think that prescription opioid reduction is going to be true to have been the main driver of the U.S. suicide trend. Uh, the first one is when uh, individuals sign uh, fill this out. One, have you ever had um, anybody who is going through this and say that they are at risk for yeah. themselves? Um, and then second, for uh, people who do fill the surveys out um, and they don't qualify, is there any data that you get from that that may help at a future date? So the two questions are, one, have there been people who say, I'm at risk right now? And the second is, is there other information we get from people who don't qualify? So the first thing we anticipated in advance, I'm curious if I can get a web browser up here, because that would be fun to show you. So we anticipated that we would get a lot of people coming to us saying that they are being reduced against their will. And since we seem to be the only people who care about the problem, what 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 are you going to do for me? Um, I'm in trauma in Oklahoma, California, Washington, D.C. Um, and we know that the study team is not equipped to, in fact, this is almost insoluble. I get reports like this from patients all over the country. And I was receiving these reports long before we started the study because I was advocating in this domain. And um, we were like, sort of, we can't ignore what to do when people say that they're in trauma and yet the study can't be officially responsible to solve the trauma. So I created a guide for families that I put up on my own private medium.com website, which is essentially a walks people through what to do if the doctor is initiating a reduction. And uh, it's obviously not official medical advice, but it takes people through why is it happening? Um, actually, are there benefits from a dose reduction? We try to offer a balanced perspective that could be beneficial to you. People may be better or worse. Are there risks? These are the risks. I go through how to have a conversation with the doctor, whether to bring a family member, demanding a scheduled visit to discuss it. Uh, I think at the very bottom, because I've encountered many situations where the doctors are so overwhelmingly biased that essentially there's nothing that would change their mind. And I think near the end, it's, um, should I go to a methadone program? And methadone programs increasingly, which are for treatment of formerly diagnosed addiction, are increasingly receiving pain patients who've been let go of by the healthcare system. The second question I think you asked was not about is what do we do with people who don't qualify for this study, but who may have an important story to tell? Is that right? Is that kind of what you were hinting at? Yeah. So um, 
what we've done is we, first of all, we usually tell people that they don't qualify for this study, but then we say, would you like to be, we are trying to develop new ideas and new studies, which make, you know, would you be interested in hearing back from us when we get that? And in fact, we haven't done it yet, but I've brief, I mean, I have briefed, uh, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and people from NINDS and said, look, there's no one else who's going to look at the overdoses that happen after prescription opioid dose reduction. Uh, Nora Volkow, the director of NIDA, said, you know, what about just the suicides that happen with pain, even if there's no opioid change? Can you study those? Yes, we can. So there are other stories. And frankly, even this method could be applied to study people who had great outcomes after opioid reductions. Um, so I think it's qualitative, it's descriptive, but we are keeping track of all the respondents who we sent a note to, including those we flag as being desirable for future studies. If we, we hope that building this machine allows others to see a value in funding it to continue the work. That was really, really interesting. Is so from the the toxicology reports with these individuals? We don't have them. Yeah. Uh, no, is the answer. <laughs> Sorry, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to have them. Is there any indication that these individuals have been put onto other pain medications uh, that might have or be causing suicidal ideation? That's so. There will be a percentage for whom we get medical records. Okay. I am very interested in seeing what other medicines are prescribed. Uh, there is a uh, statistical evidence that where doctors are have been reducing opioids, particularly in older adults, they have been adding other psychoactive medications in their place, both duloxetine, yeah. which is and known as Zivalta, and the about. other is gabapentin. Yeah. So this is sometimes referred to as non-medical switching, which is to say switching that is not predicated on any real specific medical rationale for that patient, but rather because the healthcare system would feel better if the healthcare system could say it was prescribing less opioids. So as a descriptive qualitative measure, we're interested in seeing if that happens. My real question mark there is, will we get medical records for 50% of these cases or 20%? or 70%, because a lot of the people were willing to interview. I mean, if we were flooded with thousands of respondents, I would only pick people who had executor of a state authority to get medical records. But now we, we're taking everybody, and some of them don't have authority to release. So so for the individuals that you talked about, did you have medical records to know? So whether uh, We have about, I think, probably six records have come in, but we haven't reviewed them yet. And they've gone into school of public health has a team that normally does this for the uh, regards study, which is a giant cardiovascular cohort. And they're scanning all the records and we haven't developed a system to interpret and code those. Uh, but yes, I think that what happens to other medicines is a pretty darn important question because I think I want to hear from you, but do you think there could be a potential suicidogenic effect of some of the medicines people are put onto? Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be interesting to evaluate um, if some of those drugs, if you might see some trends in the medications that are given to counteract, you know, the the pain. Yeah. Um, and that, that would definitely be something to add into the study, which additional drugs are given. And, and hopefully they're not making these people go completely full turkey when they wean them off the opioids. Sometimes. And then... In which case, pain could definitely be a factor in the suicide. But if they're replacing the medications with something else, there could be a suicidal ideation associated with that with some other medications. Yeah, uh, and I've certainly seen, I mean, not the same, but I have taken care of patients who were sedated out of their minds because the doctor was reducing the opioids and throwing in four more psychoactive medicines just to show they were making progress in opioids. But they were increasing the risk of the patient plainly. These are just in my own clinic. But, and the doctor should be warning them about that. Um, yeah, but they when don't. They, when they replace the medication. It's super sad what happened in the healthcare system here. People, primary care especially, but even they just hear, get people off opioids and they, they sometimes are pretty mindless about it. I guess, so if you establish that there is this kind of link with opioid reduction and suicidality, how would you like to see clinical practice change? Do you want to see less people taking patients off opioids or policy yeah. guideline changes? What exactly? Yeah, so a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, if a healthcare change 
has the potential to do good and the potential to do harm, both. But maybe it differs as to which is more likely, depending on the person, then that decision definitely, not only does the decision have to be individualized, but has to be carried out with great care. Uh, so examples of what would constitute great care. At the individual clinic level or a hospital level, where doctors are contemplating a change in prescribing of long-term opioids, they should have access to expert support to help them decide how are they going to make a change or even to take over the care for a period of time uh, to make that change and decide if it's working. So maybe you think your patient should try a taper and maybe you've found some real decisive clinical risks that make you think we, even though taper can be risky, we've got to, we, I'm worried this person's at high risk right now. They're sedated too much, or they can't even tell me what they took. They're, they've lost track and they're drinking alcohol at the same time. So I want to make this change, but I'm afraid I can hurt the patient when I do it. So I'm going to ask for my colleague from the opioid reassessment clinic, which is the old name for the clinic that was set up at the VA two years ago, three years ago. And they're going to run that taper with really close follow-up they might switch the patient to buprenorphine. They might try the taper and say, you did okay. Or they might try it and say, you know what? We're going to go right back to those opioids, but we're going to see them every week for a while and make sure there's no alcohol going into that same patient. So this, and the decision, if you're going to do it without consent, which I think in exceptional cases you can, ordinarily I would say do it with consent. That is, it's a proposition that can involve risk and benefit. And in most of healthcare, when we have something that could change a person's for the worse or for the better, we do lay out the risks and benefits, and then we propose a plan. So I think that's at the individual clinic level, but you also have to change the system. So I was in the most fascinating meeting. Do I still have time? I can mention this. Yes. So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has quality metrics. They often adopt those metrics from a large organization called National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA the percentage of patients who had colorectal cancer screening, the percentage of patients who got their pneumonia shot. Well, there are opioid metrics produced by National Committee for Quality Assurance filtered through another partner to CMS that are then taken up by all private insurers and all Medicare insurers, one of which is opioids at high dose. And everybody assumed that opioids at high dose, the percentage of patients on opioids who are at high dose was a sign of bad care, and that if you can make that number go down, it would be better care. And even when this initial measure was proposed, there were letters that I helped write saying, this is not consistent with the CDC guideline. And we have this early data from the VA saying it could cause death. Maybe you shouldn't adopt this metric, but it was adopted. On Tuesday of this week, an advisory group that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uses for its Medicaid program advised them which measures to adopt for the new cycle of core measures and which ones to get rid of. And the staff of Mathematica proposed dropping the high dose opioids measure for this reason. The, the, the writer, the a first author of the CDC guideline testified that it must be dropped and that it had played out terribly. And several members of this panel argued aggressively that it would be terrible to not have a measure of quality in this domain. And then unless we had something to substitute for it, we should keep the measure that the CDC itself said was harming patients. They did not win. Actually, they dropped the measure. There was a vote. And I testified, as did one of the other people on our study, Kate Nicholson. We were the last two people to speak as members of the public. We were allowed to sign up and speak. Uh, and we both gave, you know, Kate is here, that's her. And then I spoke and the vote was 79% dropped the measure. That's only for Medicaid chip, and it's not mandatory. This is voluntary. States can decide what to do with this. But right away, the medical director for CMS, Shari Ling, wrote me and said, hey, I heard you spoke today. I heard you're coming to Baltimore in a month. I'd like to make sure we regularize quality metrics across CMS. Can you meet my team on Monday night? So there are people inside CMS who don't like these measures, who would love to have way to get the incentives from CMS itself to be changed so that in addition to changing the microsystem, setting up those clinical resources, we also change the incentives. As always, I found spelling errors while giving the talk.
Oh, it's still on. Okay. 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 Okay.